grace to you and peace from God our Father, but Jesus his Son, our Lord, who is the only resurrection and the life. Amen. Depends on how you translate into English and which manuscript you use. The Song of Mary, the Magnificat, and what the angel Gabriel had said to Mary. Greetings, most highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Or, if you want to read it the way the Roman Catholics do, which is perfectly acceptable translation, Hail, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Heard us translated that way before? When the Roman Catholic friends do their rosary? Every bit of the rosary is fine up until the very last phrase. Hey, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and in the, in the hour of our death. Yes, she is the mother of God, and we should honor her for that, because God chose her out of everybody. But is it necessary for her to pray for us? People put that in because they somehow thought that Jesus was still angry with us. And that he, being a good Jewish boy, would listen to his mama. Well, is Jesus angry with us? Never was. He came to reconcile the Father to us, so that the Father would no longer have to hold our sins against us. And since we had so many sins, and each sin, that was interesting, and each sin requires the penalty of blood, then there's just not enough deaths to go around, unless you're God. When Jesus took our sins upon himself, he was sufficient to cover the sins of everyone who ever was, who is, who ever shall be. Even those people who reject him. Their sins are paid for, they just refuse to accept it. They won't receive it. But everybody is covered. That's how great his sacrifice was and is for everyone. The problem we have on earth is that we're still angry at God. That's what keeps people from being saved. Because they don't get what they want. Or they don't get what they think that they need. Or they think that God doesn't listen to prayer. God always listens to prayer. The problem is what we're praying for is not always in the best interest of everyone. I use this example, I think, here as, as well as sometimes elsewhere. Suppose you have a grandmother who's 105 years old. She's long since said goodbye to the world, and her body is falling apart, and now she's on some sort of machine to keep her going. Is that the way she would want to live, or does she want to be set free to go to be with the Lord? I'm not saying you pull the plug or anything. I'm just saying that when some, some people, well, we all have to die. There's only two examples of people who never died. That was Enoch and Elijah. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, God himself died. He came back, but you know, so will all of we in God's time. The most curious example, of course, is Lazarus and some others. Oh, you know, he was, he was in, the, in the tomb. Lord, do not roll away the stone. He stinketh. He's been dead for three days. Does that show that phrase, he stinketh? <laughs> yeah. Well, he, 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 go ahead, open it. Lazarus comes out. Hey, whoa, hey, I'm cured. Then what? Then later on, he has to die again. <laughs> and then he gets to be raised again a second time. So, you know, with the Lord, everything happens in his time, in his own place, and he wants us all to be perfected. And if you pray that your grandmother at 105 should just keep on living, even though you have no, you know, she has no reason to be here. And she wants to be with her friends and family. She's probably worried. You know, I'm still here. All my friends are in heaven. They probably wonder where I, I ended up. You know? So, you know, sometimes you have to just let go and let God be God. And let us 
be his people and just let things go. We don't need to have anybody praying in the middle. We go directly to the one mediator. He's called the one mediator between, between God the Father and man, and that is Christ Jesus. That's the reason he became God and man as one Christ. So he could bridge that gap between the divine and the mortal. So he could have compassion on what we go through that the Father can't understand. The Father created these things, but he's never experienced hunger. He's never experienced thirst. What did Jesus, do you suppose, he went through in those 40 days in the wilderness? <laughs> How long have you had to go in military service having to scrounge for food? <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't do that to you, huh? Not unless you're a ranger. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But you see, he, he, he knew thirst, he knew hunger. And how about the Lord? Has he been betrayed? Yes, but has he been betrayed by friends unto death? Can't do that to the Father. But what about the Christ? Was he betrayed by friends unto death? And the ones who promised, Lord, we will be with you always, even at death, like Peter. Where was Peter when Jesus was being crucified? He ran from the guard, from the temple, you know, the courtyard of the priest, and disappeared into the hills. It wasn't until the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that he truly repented and realized how wrong he was. We do things like that to God. We still betray him in our lives. Now, let, me, let me tell you a way that I kind of feel guilty. It's because going home from here, every single intersection has someone that has a sign, is there exactly the same sign, so I think it's a movement. God bless you, happy holidays, any little bit helps. Of these people on the corner. And I would love to give them whatever they needed. I can't afford to do it. And I've got this cross in the window of my car, and I feel like a total hypocrite. Because I can't be handing out money out the window constantly. It's embarrassing, but also you kind of wonder, these people look perfectly healthy to me. They're less than half the age I am. Why are they doing this? I don't know. Some of them may have legitimate reasons, but some of them may just be there because it's easier than working. And then I feel guilty that I'm holding, not putting the best possible spin on everything as we're supposed to do, right? Put the best possible construction on everything. Isn't that what Martin Luther said to do? But it's hard to do. So I fail the Lord that way. Whereas, I suppose if I had true faith, I'd give every penny I had and just say, well, the Lord will provide hot dogs at least. <laughs> but then that's considered poor stewardship too, isn't it? So you're always caught in between something, and we all do something similar. We just have to keep going in life as best we can. But let's get back to Mary. Where she was truly remarkable isn't just that she was chosen by God, but it was her reaction. Let it be to me according to to the will of God and to his word. She had been given the gift of true humility and she was not ashamed to bear a child outside of true marriage. She was not afraid of what people would say. She was not ashamed that she would bear a child and she would have a little explaining to do to Joseph. You know? And even Joseph didn't understand at first and what did he do? He, he being a good man, he planned to write a letter of divorcement and send her home to her father. Until he received a vision from the angel in his dream, it's okay to take her as your wife because she has not been with a man. The child that is within her is from God. Ooh, well, that's different. So they abstained from, you know, completing the marriage until after she bore Jesus. And they bore all of the, I'm sure there was a lot of finger pointing going on, don't you think? In those days, much more than now, but even today, 
Don't people always look askance at single mothers? That, it's not because they left the husband, or the husband left them, but they were never married. In this world, don't we sort of say, we do pass judgment, don't we? And yet we never know what the circumstances would be. How many guys out there are slick talkers and seduce women? How many guys do you suppose are actually fully complete jerks? Give me a percentage. <laughs> <laughs> Has it gone up, say, since the 1940s? It's every generation seems to get more and more jerks. <laughs> and it's because why? Are the kids taught civics in school anymore? Are they taught responsibility? Are they taught any moral or ethical values? Any economic values? Even the families give a good example. If your parents are divorced four times, what does that say to the children? Hey, marriage isn't all that important. If we don't like it, we can always break apart. And then once it goes from there, well, it's so difficult to get a divorce, why don't we just live together? And that way, if we don't like it, we can just say, take your stuff, I'll take my stuff, and we'll go. But that doesn't always lead to a good thing either, does it? Because I know this woman, she lived in Rosemont. She wanted to marry him. He never wanted to get married. They were together for over 15 years. One day, he comes home, and he tells her, to get out, because he's found a younger woman. Illinois does not have common law not marriage. No matter how long you live together, you're not considered married like in some states. In some states, if you stay together for seven years, you're married. Not here. Well, he just told her to get out. <laughs> and since everything was in his name, did she have any recourse? No. Our world is not what it used to be. But Mary had no problem bearing a child to the Lord. And then, what is it that we've received from her? Not just her acceptance, but a song of joy that we call the Magnificat. And the first word, my soul magnifies the Lord, or it magnifies the Lord my soul. That's how it's actually written. And that's what Magnificat means. It magnifies. It, 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 it lifts up. And the name of God is held up to the highest glory. The Holy of Holies. Because he has chosen to do this wonderful thing. Not just through me, but for all mankind. That the Savior shall come into this world. Through me. And that was her marvel. How many of us have the humility if God says to us, I'm going to do something really special through you, are you going to be that humble? Let me ask you something. What did Moses do when God spoke to him about that? Moses was already ready to retire. He was 80 years old. 50 years he had worked as a shepherd in, Mid in Midian. And then at 80 years old, he saw this fire up on the mountainside. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to take a look. See what happens when your curiosity kills the cat? He goes up there and, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. Okay. Because, and he walks on there and, I've got a job for you. You're going to go to Egypt. You're kidding me. You're going to free my people. Yeah, you're out of your mind. <laughs> Why me? I have a halt, halt, halt tongue. Apparently Moses had a speech impediment. Don't worry. I'll send Aaron along with you. Oh, no. Not him. No matter how many times Moses complained, at the very end, what did God say? You're going. And Moses just sort of turned tail and said, okay, fine. I'm going to do that. And he went. It took him several years to get there. And then he ran up with someone that he really didn't want to meet up with. You know, Pharaoh's son, the one under whom he was raised. And, uh, well, you know what happened there. Things didn't go quite right, did they? And so he had to give him sign after sign after sign until finally Pharaoh broke down and said, fine, take your people and get out of here. 
but then even he changed his mind and what he should send the soldiers after them and then we get the song of the sea horse and rider drowned in the sea because the Lord would not let Pharaoh take his people the one that he rescued with an outstretched arm and by a mighty hand he would not let them take him back into slavery and that is what he has done through Jesus Christ. He has sent him into this world to take us out of the hand of the devil. And he will never let the devil take us back again. Now, if we're stupid enough to turn around and go back like some of the Hebrews wanted to, remember Korah and some of the others, why did he take us out of the land of Egypt? There we had meat and we had vegetables, we had onions, we had garlic, we had cucumbers, we had melons. And out here, what do we got? This flaky stuff. Man. And what did God do to Korah and his followers, though? <coughs> Opened a crack under them, smashed them in the earth. Gone. Those who are ungrateful to God, God says, I don't need you. I don't think if that's the way it looks right now, because now he gives us a chance to repent. But these people were trying to turn the hearts of everybody to go back to Egypt because it was easier. Is it always best to take the easy way out? Is God's way ever really the easy way out? How many of you now, in these days, face pressure by friends and, I don't know, associates to go the way of the world? Now there's a young man, who's been, he's been in Germany, and Germany is no longer a Christian country. And you can imagine the kind of things that some other soldiers behave in. You think it's hard to resist going with all of your friends and all of your all of your soldier buddies? Yeah, huh? It's kind of you know they, they kind of pressure you, and then most people do what? They give in. But if you stand strong in the Lord and call upon his name, he will give you the strength to endure all things and all abuses. <clears throat> and you will know that he is there with you, for you, beside you, and that he will give you the courage to face anything that the world may throw your way. But there was always ridicule, and there always will be for God's people. And yet we have to consider that because of that, what did Jesus do? His mother was not condemned by Joseph. And that was a movement of the Holy Spirit, of God working through the dream. And when Jesus, our Lord, when people hypocritically brought people to him, this woman is a sinner. And Jesus said, oh yeah, is that right? Tell me about it. And he squats down and starts to do them in the sand, you know. And, and the Pharisees are kind of upset with him. You're doodling in the sand. You're not listening to us. Well, you know, you say she committed adultery. Where's the guy? You can't commit adultery all by yourself. Where's the guy? And so from, from the beginning with the eldest to the youngest, they dropped their rocks and they walked away because the guy with whom she was committing adultery was probably one of them. You know? That's the way it works. And then the woman, she stands up and Jesus says to her, so who is there to condemn you? And she looks around and she says, no one, my Lord. And she says, then neither do I. Go and be at peace and sin no more. And that is his attitude towards us in everything. People can always accuse us of things. And we can feel guilty about something. But we always have to look at who's accusing us and whether or not they've done the same thing and whether or not the Lord himself accuses us. Are we guilty of anything as far as God is concerned or have the penalties already been paid for everything? That's not rhetorical, I'm asking you. Have your sins already been paid for? Does this mean you can go ahead and start planning more sins? Okay, that's taking the Lord for advantage. Isn't it? You can't do that. However, it doesn't, it means we don't have to be living in fear for all of our sins, all of our days. God understands slips, he understands mistakes, he understands that we're basically 
not all that bright. We're like sheep. You know? And what are sheep? There are creatures that can drown in four inches of water because they don't have the sense to stand up. And he knows that because of our weakness, we've never been able to be righteous. So he took care of our, the righteousness for us. He became our righteousness. That's what he is called. The Lord our righteousness. And it is not I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And so when the Father looks at me, who does he see? He sees the beauty of his Son. And also in each and every one of you. And who can argue or complain about that? That the Lord here is with us and in us, and we are viewed as being beautiful and perfect to the Father. So we live our lives as best we can. We call upon the name of the Lord, and when he asks us to come do something, well, sometimes we just have to go, even though it's not quite what we think is in plans, because why? He knows what's good. He knows what's right. And being God, it's kind of annoying, but he's always right. <laughs> and so when he calls us to do something, do it. Because in the end, you will find that he has glorified himself and you through his word and through his will. And you will live a life of joy deep down in your heart. And may the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding fill our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.